In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. A very warm welcome to St. Mary's the University Church, particularly if you're joining us for the first time, or you're joining us online from home. You're very welcome. As we prepare to celebrate this Eucharist together, we remember God's presence with us as we say, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we prepare to celebrate the presence of Christ in word and sacrament, let us call to mind and confess our sins. Almighty God, our, our Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Father, we have, have sinned, sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate faults. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We remain standing as we pray. Almighty God, who called your church to bear witness that you were in Christ reconciling the world to yourself, help us to proclaim the good news of your love, that all who hear it may be drawn to you through him who was lifted up on the cross and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. A reading from the letter to the Romans. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honour. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you.
Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. For the word of the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Alleluia. Hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, 
There are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap hot coals upon their heads. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. As you may know, the Sunday lectionary with the, which the Church of England follows, and not just the C of E, but the wider Anglican Communion, the Roman Catholic Church, Lutherans, Methodists, and many others, appoints not two, but three readings for each Sunday over a three-year cycle. One from the Hebrew Scriptures, one from one of the New Testament books that isn't one of the Gospels, and a reading from one of the four Gospels. I realize this is not the most exciting way to start a sermon, but just please hang in with me here. (laughs) Here at St. Mary's, the preacher gets to choose either the passage from the Hebrew Scriptures or the New Testament reading appointed. By and large here, and this is true for me too, preachers tend to go for the Hebrew Bible reading. Those of us who are Anglicans of a certain vintage we'll know that the ecumenical common lectionary we follow brought into Anglican Eucharistic worship the riches of the Hebrew scriptures. In the days of Holy Communion by the Book of Common Prayer, you got an epistle, usually a bit of Paul, and a reading from one of the Gospels over a one-year cycle, but never a reading from the Hebrew scriptures. When something called the parish communion movement started in the early 20th century, Holy Communion replaced matins or morning prayer as the main service on Sunday in many Anglican churches, a a good development. In addition, over the course of the 20th century, Evensong has become a much rarer Sunday parochial staple. Not that you would think that in Oxford, as cathedrals and chapels are the places where it has remained an important liturgical provision. Now, one of the unintended consequences, I think, of the parish communion movement was that Anglicans, fair to say both clergy and laity, became less and less engaged with the Hebrew scriptures. Matins always had a psalm and both an Old and New Testament reading. The common lectionary also provides a psalm, but I'm going to pick my battles here. The common uh, lectionary rectifies that impoverishment and strikes a blow against an early church heresy that can still pop up its head nowadays, Marcionism, named after a second century chap called Marcion. It's very easy the way those heresies work. Now, hardcore Marcionism taught that Jesus was not the son of the God of the Hebrews, but the son of a much nicer, above it all, transcendent sort of God, not a God involved in all the muck of human affairs. That God, the God of the Hebrews, according to Marcion, is the screw-up responsible for creation. Creation in Marcionism is not a good thing because the material world is yucky and poopy. And despite what Genesis tells us, creation is not good. Writing this sermon yesterday, it struck me that some climate change deniers may be channeling a modern day version of Marcinism. At its milder end though, it lives on in the view that the New Testament negates or makes irrelevant or must always be the lens for the wisdom of the old. At best, the Old Testament is a sort of warm-up band for the main attraction of the New Testament, something I always find particularly challenging in Advent, 
despite loving that season of the church year. Even our nomenclature of old and new testaments can reflect this. When I was a graduate student, I attended an interfaith service and the well-intentioned Anglican priest introduced the rabbi by saying that a rabbi so-and-so was going to read from the Old Testament. The rabbi got to the lectern, gave us a stern look and said, I'm going to read from the Bible. And that has stuck with me. So you're thinking, where is she going with this? Well, when I looked at the readings for this Sunday a few weeks ago to start thinking about what to preach about, I just couldn't get that passage from Romans out of my head. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap hot coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So all the, all the above is by way of saying that if we did have all three readings, we would have collectively since June, Sunday by Sunday, been trooping our way through Paul's longest, most expansive, most sophisticated, complicated, baffling, and at times heartbreakingly moving letter in the New Testament. And in the law of unintended consequences, as the parish communion movement did for the Bible, our practice here of admitting one of the reasons I think maybe has led to a latter-day uh, lack of engagement with Paul. So if we had been collectively trooping our way through Romans, under the sum, um, through Romans over the summer, today's passage might make more sense. I am not a biblical scholar, so I'm braced for multiple corrections at coffee. But at the risk of dangerous simplification, before we get to our passage this morning, Paul has made his most complete, though admittedly at times somewhat torturous, argument that we human beings are A, screw-ups of the first order who can't even do the right thing even if we tried, and frankly we don't even try very often, and yet B, are justified by the grace given us by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As he says in chapter 6, the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Note here, free gift, absolutely free. Put away your wallet, your money is no good here. Nothing to be earned, no tricks, no terms and conditions, not free like a free lunch, which we all know there is no such thing. We can fuss and fret about whether we are good enough for God to love. We can channel that pernicious inner voice that says it really is all about performance, about works. But Paul tells us it is a free gift. And Bonhoeffer's famous gloss on Paul is true. This grace is free, not cheap. It is grace accomplished for us by nothing else than the life death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So to this morning, having established our inability to achieve our own salvation, but rather that we are accepted and loved entirely by grace alone, Paul is starting to fret that those folks in Rome, and by extension us folks here and now, may think there is no need to change, grow, or strive. Note his list of virtues. It's a lower bar than Jesus' rebuke to his disciples in our gospel reading. These qualities are not heroic or sexy, but about the long haul, often hidden, discreet, patience, perseverance, mutual respect, everyday love. Paul doesn't think these are easy. In fact, there's plenty of ev evidence that he was pretty bad at all these qualities himself. Paul, I think, is speaking out of self-awareness, not self-righteousness. Like us, he's only human. And if he can't resist citing the book of Proverbs, that when you're nice to your enemies, you're also heaping hot coals upon their heads in case the virtue of the act itself, well, just isn't enough. When that happens, just focus on those hot coals, everybody. 
Paul's language is deliberately exaggerated. As one commentator, Jane Williams, has put it, we are to be competitively respectful, zealous in service, joyful in hope, and almost embarrassingly hospitable. She notes that Paul, quote, needs the Christian community to understand that these qualities will not come by accident. They need to be worked out with intentionality, dedication, and energy. In the Church of England, we need this intentionality as we approach what I hope will be some progress in changing in an inclusive direction in the explicit public teaching of our church in matters of human sexuality. The meeting of the General Synod, which is in November, it's not far away, may actually be the crunch point. Though as a church, we have a collective crunch phobia, I have to say. As a member of the General Synod for 13 years now, I've certainly had my capacity for patience, perseverance, mutual respect, and love tested. And if sometimes I've let an image of hot coals flash before my eyes, well, like Paul, like you, I'm only human. So it might be good to hear regularly in our Eucharistic worship, along with the riches of the Hebrew Bible and the Gospels, Paul's dispatches to folks as flawed and lovable as he was, as we are. Just a thought. Amen. Let us stand to profess the faith in which we seek to grow. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Almighty God, we pray for your church and all its leaders worldwide, including Bishop Stephen and our clergy here at St. Mary's. Give them courage and hope as they proclaim the good news of your love. May all who hear be drawn to you. As members of the church, the body of Christ, help us to hold fast to what is good, to be ardent in spirit to persevere in prayer, to be patient in suffering, and to live in harmony with one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, your son Jesus suffered for our sake on the cross. We pray for the alleviation of all suffering as a result of famine, war, or natural disasters. We pray for the peace-loving and powerless, those made homeless or orphaned, those going hungry and thirsty. We pray and give thanks for the kindness of friends and strangers 
and for all working to help those in need, from frontline medics to relief workers and humanitarian charities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we pray for all in positions of authority, from sovereigns, presidents and ministers, to judges, CEOs and trade union leaders. Give them wisdom, integrity and compassion, that they might use the power invested in them to promote the common good and make wise and selfless decisions. We pray in particular at this time for improved industrial relations and a new spirit of understanding and compromise between employers and employees. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we thank you for time spent with family and friends over the holidays. As a new academic year begins, we pray for children and teachers returning to school. We pray for all the city schools in particular, that they may be places where individuals are valued and nurtured, where friendships are formed and flourish, and where learning is exciting and fulfilling. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, you have called us to follow you. We pray for your blessing on the coming week, that all our actions and interactions would be suffused with your love. Give us grace to see glimmers of your glory in the world around us and in the people we encounter. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mercy, we pray for all those in any kind of need and for all who are suffering in body, mind or spirit. Especially this morning, we pray for Anatoly, Ana, Annabelle, for Geoffrey, Julia and Barbara for John, Ambrose, and Jenny, for Ellen, Michael Fraser, and Elizabeth, and for Richard, Moose, and any others known to us. We ask that you would guard and protect them from all pain, that you would calm their fears and that you would comfort them with your continual presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us, loving Father, as we remember those whom we love but no longer see, and especially Jim Godfrey and Ludmilla Nikki Forover. According to your promises, grant us with them a share in your eternal kingdom. Rejoicing in the fellowship of St. Mary the Virgin and all your saints, we commend ourselves and the whole creation to your unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace.
Blessed be God, by whose grace creation is renewed, by whose love heaven is opened, by whose mercy we offer our sacrifice of praise. Blessed, Blessed be, be God, God forever. forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we in the company of the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but but only only say the word, and I shall be healed.
Let us pray. God, our Creator, you feed your children with the true manna, the living bread from heaven. Let this holy food sustain us through our earthly pilgrimage until we come to that place where hunger and thirst are no more. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Will you please be seated? Friends, it's very good to welcome you to St. Mary's this morning. Please do join us for refreshments in the De Broom Chapel over there immediately after the service. You'll be very welcome. And if this is your first time at St. Mary's, please do make a point of introducing yourselves to one of the clergy. Now, next weekend is the Open Doors weekend. There will be a talk by Geoffrey Tyack in the Old Library next Sunday at 12 noon. And then there'll be choral evensong at St. Cross at Hollywell at 5 p.m. Please do join us. The Prefectus of Hollywell Manor has very kindly invited us to drinks at Hollywell Manor after the service. And Dame Helen Ghosh, the Master of Balliol, will preach. You may be aware of recent press coverage about some of the parochial church council's plans for the churchyard and cafe. Over the last two years, the PCC has been developing some exciting plans which will serve to enhance our Ministry of Hospitality. This will include a planned new social enterprise, repairs to stonework, replanting of the gardens, and a major redevelopment of the cafe facilities. The plan is to ensure that this much-loved space can continue to welcome visitors for years to come. In the next few months, there will be a series of presentations for the congregation so that you can learn about these plans for the future. And if you have any questions at this point, then please don't hesitate to get in touch with the church wardens or with me. Finally, it's great to have Judith preaching this morning. Many of you will be aware that Judith is stepping down from her role as chaplain of Corpus at the end of this month. So this is officially the last time she will preach for us as the chaplain of Corpus. The good news is that she will remain as part of the ministry team here at St. Mary's, and if anything, we might see a bit more of her, but only when she gets back in the autumn from a rather lovely sounding trip to Rome. But to mark her retirement from Corpus, 
um, there's this small token of our appreciation. Will you please stand? The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name Amen. of Christ. Amen. Amen.